we are a consortium of uh, conservation organizations and together we work on tackling biodiversity issues affecting us in Africa. Uh, some of our members are represented here, Africa Wildlife Foundation um, and others that are here, as well as uh, we have uh, you know, partnership and MOUs with uh, many other members. So we do bring an a con a collective uh, a consortium of different organizations so that we can be able to enhance the scale and the impact of our work. The Africa Wildlife Foundation is the oldest and largest the Pan-African International Organization. We were founded in 1961. We are headquartered in Nairobi, Karen actually. We have a representative office in 14 other countries and one, and one in Washington, D.C. We are the primary advocate for Africa's wildlife. Our mission is to ensure that wildlife and their habitats and endure as an essential part of modern and prosperous Africa. It is our conviction that the survival of wildlife and healthy ecosystems in Africa hinges on one factor, linking Africa's conservation agenda in meaningful ways to the aspirations and mindsets of African people. This is what AWF truly represents. As home to over a, 30, a third of the global e economic um, ecosystems, nature essentially presents Africa an untapped investment and in green development opportunity and is a key strategic asset that can be used as a bargaining power in the global ne negotiations and arena for Africa. The sustainable use of natural resources through a diversified biodiversity economy can promote conservation outcomes and sustainable development, providing employment and important financial resources for climate adaptation and mitigation and for development itself, as well as reducing the risk and building resilience economically and environmentally. So how does the role of media as agenda setters and decision makers in, in their respective media houses come to play here. So you, my friends, weld the power to shift the narrative for ensuring conservation is given the priority and attention it deserves in order to push for the much needed transformation today. We know Kenya and Africa at large, we are rich in biodiversity from plants, uh, uh, we have 1,100 1, uh, bird, bird species in, in Kenya. We have over 7,000 uh, different types of uh, plants uh, within, within, our, within our boundaries, and many more invertebrates and, and, and mammals, etc. So how do we then take recognition of these species or this biodiversity as we continue planning our, our our development, uh, be it energy, be it roads, be it uh, whatever type of development that we, we would want to, to expand. So there is need for careful planning to reconcile this development to safeguard our important natural heritage. There is increasing you know, demand for integration and mainstreaming biodiversity into these into this, into this sectors. So, there is significant incentives. We had a previous president in the, in the previous COP in, um, in Glasgow saying that Kenya is in the, in the, is in the forefront in, um, in, uh, in green growth. And there's been a renewed, uh, renewed, uh, renewed uh, focus on green, green growth economy, where you're looking at wind, solar, and geothermal. If you read our laws in our country, we talk about if a critical endangered species is killed by anyone, you'll be charged 20 million Kenya shillings and five years imprisonment, right? You get, but that's an elephant thing. Okay, elephants and, uh, you know, they don't switch brother that thing. But birds are equally threatened and other biodiversity. So who, who is responsible to be charged or who is responsible to, to, to get, uh, to be involved within this, within this mix of, uh, of conversation? Bird Life International. It is the largest uh, conservation, a network of, of conservation civil society organizations globally, bringing together um, more than 120 uh, civil society organizations globally um, in 116 countries. So we protect birds, 
and biodiversity and the areas that are important for birds. Uh, we promote sustainability while working with governments, while working with local communities, putting the people at the center. Um, and in each of those countries, we have one partner organizations. We have 26 civil society organizations that are bird life partners in Africa. We are at a tipping point and we need to do something to keep the 1.5 degrees centigrade, centigrade alive. Uh, this means, um, uh, th this is the, 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 uh, the goal of the Paris Agreement to keep temperatures below two, uh, 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 below 1.5, rising uh, below 1.5 degrees, um, and uh, if anything, not to go up uh, above uh, two, two degrees. The key message is climate and biodiversity crisis threaten everything about us. It threatens people, threatens livelihoods, threatens well human well-being, it threatens uh, everything that. Uh, that, 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 is, that matters to us, and it uh, uh, threatens our children and our ch children's children. And protecting intact ecosystems is a key climate solution. COP28 is coming. Is it the same conversation that you're going to have and say, uh, we are the least emitters, yet we are the, we are, then now, then what? So action in terms of us as, as Africans on what we can do in order to actually actualize um, the climate uh, mitigation and all that. I think that it, it's sort of a question, but I think it's a concern that everybody and all of us should put our heads together and think about the action. Because I think at some point, even our president, uh, Dr. William Ruto, talked about the he doesn't see the reason for us to have these cops. I don't know. That is a, uh, a discussion that I think I'm just having a concern. Who is policing the polluters? Because by the tail end of uh, COP27 in uh, Sharm El Sheikh, the biggest polluter didn't do any commitment, who is uh, China. So who is policing this and who are they reporting them to? We as journalists write about people and what people do. So the problem that we have had with climate change um, communication and scientists in particular is that um, we want to relate those figures or those discussions to real life. For example, if I go to Nairobi River as an example, make me, make me feel it. Yeah, so can we unpack, uh, when we're talking about loss and damage, can we unpack that? How do we deal with the, the issue of lethargy and the feeling like the COP, the conference of party, you're moving from this meeting to the other and not seeing tangible action? I think we cannot afford to give up. We need to make sure, first of all, that uh, the developing countries and Africa is properly represented. Because if you're not there, no one raises your issues. You need to be on the negotiating table, because that is how multilateral processes work. And I must say that Africa, over time, um, and I'm sure uh, Fred and, and others will, will probably agree with me, that Africa has advanced in terms of its negotiating capacity, in terms of being able to push its issues. I remember during, um, uh, in Montreal, Africa, the Africa Group of Negotiators on Biodiversity uh, wanted one per, uh, the global community to commit 1% of GDP, the, uh, the gross domestic, domestic product, their, 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 their national wealth to the protection of biodiversity. They were that bold and they went full throttle. Of course, that was scattered, you know, that, that, that was, uh, uh, did not see the light of day. But they did, they, they made their statement. And I think over time we are seeing strong African delegations. We are seeing, seeing strong leadership in both biodiversity and, uh, and climate. And we are seeing younger and younger peop uh, you know, people rising up, you know, uh, in you know these countries uh, to uh, stand up for Africa. Conservation affects all of us. I think all of us can sit here and each one of you in this room know how either your farm at home or your living has been affected by climate change, over rain, too much heat, chickens dying, etc., etc. So I just want to stress that we're all part of this club. 
It's not an invitation only. We're a part of this. Secondly, what I'd like to say is that as human beings, we're also part of biodiversity. We don't, we don't hold some completely alien position in the natural world. So when we talk about animals, it's not us and them. Without them, we won't be us. So it's important that we remember where we are in all of this. So that we're not looking at this as a private exclusive club, and we're not looking at human beings as being a separate species living on planet Earth with other things that don't affect us. And the concern I have about humanity today, we keep talking about the extinction of other species. We never look at ourselves. We are having diseases popping out of the natural world because of our complete lack of regard and respect for it. And instead of pa passing the buck, that responsibility to someone else, it's not my fault, it's city council's fault. I'm not going to pay the kind of money that my KPNL are sending me every month. It is our responsibility. The collaboration is not about a sector. It continues when you go home. It continues in your everyday life.